feet is all about the hearing and the balance. And for that reason, it's called the vestibular cochlear system. Testing here involves making sure that the patient is able to hear first. So what we can do here is arrange for a distraction technique, having the patient rubbing over their own tragus, which will make a noise um, able to overcome any um, sound that should be coming in from that ear, whereupon we'd whisper in the other ear. If they can hear on both sides, we know that they've got adequate hearing in order to continue on the test. In terms of testing cranial nerve 7, once we've done our distraction technique to confirm that their hearing is working, we need to use a tuning fork to see how the patient's um, hearing is balanced. So we strike the tuning fork and have a nice ringing noise, which would then be put onto the forehead. That will give a sound to the patient in either the middle of their forehead, the right ear, or the left ear. We want to find the sound being central. The Weber's test is performed using 512 Hertz tuning fork and is able to identify unilateral conductive hearing loss. This is where something is blocking the sound going to the ear. The commonest example here would be that of earwax. The Weber's test is also able to identify a unilateral sensory hearing loss. This is where the hearing is impaired due to a problem with the hearing apparatus whether that's the inner ear, the sensory organ itself, or the vestibular cochlear nerve. It should also be noted that sensory neurohearing loss is the commonest cause of hearing impairment, of which the most frequently seen is age-related hearing loss, or presbyacusis. A normal result for Weber's test would be the patient commenting that the sound is heard centrally or equally between both ears. If Weber's test has the sound lateralizing, i.e. going to one ear or the other, that would indicate that there is a problem. The patient will have either conductive hearing loss, or they may have a sensory neural hearing loss. With the Weber's test, if the patient has a conductive hearing loss in one ear, then the patient will find that they are able to hear the tuning fork louder in that affected side. So, what do you think is the commonest cause of conductive hearing loss? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's simple earwax, anything blocking this tympanic membrane. One of the ways that I've always thought about this, just to make things easier in my head, is that earwax is sticky and thus will pull the sound toward the affected ear. If, however, the patient hears better in their normal ear, then we assume there is a sensory neural loss in the other ear, in the defective ear. Bizarrely enough, it's sensory neural hearing loss which is the commonest cause of problems with people's hearing. So presbyacusis, so problems with age, if they've been exposed to excess noise, which may have damaged the hearing apparatus. Surprisingly, it's sensory neural deafness, which is the most common cause of hearing loss. If we've got a problem with the apparatus of hearing, rather than anything in terms of the conduction there, then we're going to get reduced hearing. For example, presbyacusis, hearing loss associated with old age, if we have problems where patients have been exposed to loud noises, that will cause sensory neural hearing loss. Patients with diabetes, again, because diabetes affects all nerves. If there are tumours pressing on this area, bear in mind I go back to our cranial nerve 5 discussion, where we said that cranial nerve 8 caused 5% of all tumours and was a very common cause of issues with the trigeminal nerve. Drugs are also a common cause of sensory neural hearing loss. Unfortunately, you can't determine from the Weber's test on its own which ear is affected. Thus, we need to do further investigations. So then we need to test Rinne's. So we strike the tuning fork and place it on the patient's mastoid process behind the ear. 
and we'll leave it there until they can't hear the sound anymore. Then we bring the tuning fork back to place in front of their ear, but we do that so that the vibrations are going directly into the ear, not away from the ear. That will then tell us if their air conduction going into the ear is better than their bone conduction when the tuning fork is on the back of the ear. With the tuning fork, we should find that air conduction is better than bone conduction, i.e. the patient can hear with the ear after we've removed it from the side of the head. That is because we should expect hearing to be collected by the ear, transmitted down the canal to the tympanic membrane, whereupon it's transmitted to the apparatus of hearing. If there is something affecting this apparatus of hearing, so a problem with cranial nerve eight, then we may not get appropriate recognition of the sound, and thus we may find that bone conduction is actually better than air conduction. Hence why there is a table associated with Weber's and Rinne's tests to determine if we have a sensory neural hearing loss or a conductive hearing loss. In terms of hearing loss, we need to go back to the eyes surprisingly once again. If there's a problem with the vestibular cochlear system, which is involved in balance as well, that's why we don't just call it the hearing nerve, we can also see the effects on the eyes, whereupon we might see nystagmus, the rhythmic beating of the eyes side to side. There are two types of nystagmus, which essentially we need to be aware of. That is pathological nystagmus as a result of damage to one or more components of the vestibular system. Then we have benign nystagmus, where we still have involuntary movement of the eye, but there likely due to the vestibular ochlear reflex. So a good example of physiological nystagmus that many people will be aware of would be the beating of the eye that is seen if someone is spun round and round on a chair continually and then stops. With this, you'll see the nystagmus beating in the opposite direction of the rotation that a person had been spun in. You may also see optokinetic nystagmus if you're looking at things passing by when riding on a train. In terms of pathological nystagmus, we can have a central nystagmus where the eye beats up and down. This is normally due to problems with the midbrain or the cerebellum. And slightly more common is the peripheral nystagmus, again a specific disease of the vestibular system, so here cranial nerve 8. A common example of that will be benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So if a patient lies down and rolls over in bed, or sits up, they get vertigo so the room feels like it's spinning. At that point we'd expect to see nystagmus in the patient's eyes, and we'd expect the direction of that nystagmus to go towards the affected vestibular nerve. Now we're going to have a look over your hearing. Have you noticed any problems with your hearing? No. Good. So we're going to start off, if you could just rub the front of your ear, please, and I'm going to say a word, and I'd like you to repeat it back to me, please. 100. 100. Okay, and if we could swap over for me. 99. Excellent. So we know that everything seems to be working well. The next thing we're going to do, I'm going to get this tuning fork, we're going to strike it, and I'll put it in your forehead. Okay. And we're just going to do the same again. So I'm just going to put this on your forehead, and tell me if you can, where you can hear the noise. Is it left, right, or middle? Middle. Okay, super. So we need to do an additional test on that, which will involve putting this on the bone behind your ear, when the sound stops, please tell me, and I'm going to move it round, and I want to see if you can hear it then. Okay. So I'm going to need to come round to the back in order to do that. And tell me when you can't hear the noise anymore. Yeah. Okay, and can you hear it now? Yes. Excellent. We'll do the same on this side. Okay, you can hear the noise? Yeah. Okay, tell me when you can't. Can you hear it there? Yes. Excellent.